Good evening and welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your sit-in host, Rob Dew. Alex is taking the night off for a well-deserved little R&R, &R uh, but he will be back on Monday with a very special Ron Paul presentation. We're going to show some vintage Ron Paul clips that proves that he's the same guy 20 years ago as the same guy today and not like these other shape-shifting troglodytes that are running for Republican uh, nomination for the presidency. Coming up, we're going to have Don Browning, and who's retired OKC police officer, and Holland Vanden Neuenhoff from the film A Noble Lie. He's one of the producers and researchers. And it's a film we carry here at Infowars.com. And they're going to be talking mainly about Don's uh, threats that he received from the FBI while he was in doing his own investigation and his police work there. And it uh, just goes to show you that you know good cops do want to get the truth out there, and they are pressured from above to uh, just sit back and let things happen. But let's get to our headlines today. We got an interesting TSA story today. Congress to fund massive expansion of TSA checkpoints. And Paul Joseph Watson writes in this InfoWars.com article, Congress is set to give the green light on funding for a massive expansion of TSA checkpoints with the federal agency already responsible for over 9,000 such checkpoints. And last year, amidst increased fears, America is turning into a police state following the passage of the indefinite detention bill, which is the NDAA bill. Goes on to say the TSA's 25 of Viper teams, which stands for Visible Intermodal Prevention and Response, have run more than 9,300 unannounced checkpoints and other search operations in the last year. And uh, the Department of Homeland Security is asking Congress they want to have 12 more teams um, in the next upcoming year. So they want to spend a total of $134 million on top of what they're already spending at the airports, which is $5 billion. You know how many terrorists they found? Zero. That's what you get for $5 plus billion. And uh, this reminds me of earlier this year, we reported on a TSA checkpoint that was happening on the streets of Tennessee. And we're going to show you part of that clip, which also goes into a little bit of a uh, uh, Janet, <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I, I can't even say it's a Janet Napolitano and her little mind control bit that was going on in Walmart. And then Alex ties it in in uh, the uh, part of police state four. So here's that clip now. Tuesday, Tennessee was the first to do this simultaneously at five way stations and two bus stations statewide. They're recruiting truck drivers like Rudy Gonzalez into the first observer highway security program to say something if they see something. Not only truck drivers, but cars, everybody should be in be aware of what's going out on the road. It's all meant to urge every driver to call authorities if they see something suspicious. Hi, I'm Janet Napolitano, Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Homeland Security begins with hometown security. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong, just as well funded. Uh, the airport adventures, which they now admit are going nationwide with the Viper teams at bus stops, train stops, the streets, shopping malls, random vans, sending you through body scanners, biometrically scanning 360, your naked body. Now TSA agents are on the interstates fighting terrorism with visible intermodal prevention and response or Viper operations. The Tennessee Highway Patrol is checking trucks with drug and bomb sniffing dogs during random inspections. The bottom line is this, if you see something suspicious, say something about it. And there's that buzzword, see something, say something, report on your neighbors, um, look around for stuff, do your own investigating, it's really funny. Um, I really want to go into this, uh, that statement that President Obama made, you know, we have to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong. And uh, that's basically what you're seeing with these TSA agents, these are not officers of the law. Uh, we shouldn't even call them officers because they're not officers. They do not take an oath to the Constitution. These are just, they're literal brown shirts that we have out there that are going through our luggage. They're sticking their hands down your pants. And if you've gone through the airport, you know what it's like. I mean, they're taking old ladies and strip searching them. And then they say, oh, it's not a strip search because we don't call it a strip search. We call it a search. And uh, you know what happened to the brown shirts. They got into power. They helped Hitler get into power. And then there is what we call the night of long knives where Hitler went around and assassinating all the leaders because he wanted to take full power and he was afraid these guys would then go after his power. So those of you out there that serve the system 
and do this stuff and do it with impunity, your day will come. It'll, it'll happen. So that's about all I have to say on that one. Let's go uh, international here. We got China warns of an EU carbon tax trade war. So the trade wars are going to heat up, and this is from the Financial Times. China has warned the European Union to abandon its controversial carbon tax on airlines or risk provoking a global trade war. Adding weight to the warning, an industry insider told the Financial Times that the Chinese government was seriously considering measures to hit back at the EU if it insists on charging international airlines for their carbon emissions. And what this does, this goes back to the day before, Mail Online reported that uh, there's going to be a hike in airplane fares internationally to anybody flying into the EU. And uh, this is so, so they could uh, offset the carbon footprint. This goes into Europe's right to tackle pollution from all airlines using its airports does not breach international laws, what the EU judges were ruling. And uh, you had American and Canadian airlines filing a, uh, a challenge on this, and that was essentially just thrown out. It was thrown out of court, and they said, sorry, we're going to charge you extra money. And in the back of this article, it actually tells you what it'll amount to. It's going to be about a $50 per ticket cost of uh, Chinese flights going to Europe and a 20 or so cost per ticket. And that's just in the first year. And of course, we all know how these taxes work. They always ramp up after every year. I'm going to go back to the Financial Times article now. Um, the only country that does support this uh, is the EU. There's no other countries that are supporting this. And the EU isn't a country. It's a collection of countries. And uh, I'll go to number three here. This is a trade barrier in the name of environmental protection, and it constitutes an attack on the interest of travelers and international aviation industry, it says in an editorial. It will be difficult to avoid a trade war focused on carbon tax for airlines. Connie Hedgegaard, Europe's climate commissioner, said on Wednesday that she was very satisfied with the ECJ's ruling and that she expected global air airlines to respect European law. So this is essentially a tax on breathing that the European Union wants to set the precedent for, that they could say, hey, you're putting off too much carbon, we're going to start charging you more money. Even though when you look at the ice core samples from the past, we had more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, and there was plenty of life. And um, so this is all about taxing you for breathing, and it's to create this new green Nazi police state that's going to keep everybody oppressed unless you're an insider. Because I guarantee you, they're not going to be charging these billionaires money to fly around in their private jets. They're going to be exempt from it. It's just going to be you paying for it. Uh, let's go on. The IMF urges members to boost funding under a 2010 plan. And basically what this is, is they want uh, the IMF here is urging their members to start charging you more taxes so they can pay for more of these bailouts to the bigger banks. It has nothing to do with helping the uh, international economy in any way unless you're a banker. That's, those are the only people that are going to be uh, saved from this. And I think in Davos they were talking about this last year that they needed a total of a hundred trillion and here they're only talking about 755 billion. But they actually want a hundred trillion total in tax money that you're going to have to pay in order to keep these banks afloat and keep these guys living uh, high on the hog. And uh, now we go to some Ron Paul news. New T. Gingrich labels Ron Paul's entire support base as people who want to legalize drugs. So all those people out there that hold Ron Paul signs in the cold, that put Ron Paul signs up, that make Ron Paul phone calls, all the volunteers out there, nothing but a bunch of people who want to legalize drugs. The allegation is clear. Newt Gingrich's latest accusation that Ron Paul's volunteer base is people who want to legalize drugs is designated to create the impression that anyone who votes for Paul is at best socially irresponsible or at worst a crack-addled junkie. And uh, Steve Watson wrote that. Very apropos. And, and there you go. There's, there's Newt holding a big fatty right there. He's an admitted pot smoker. And he's called for uh, the death sentence for people who, who have pot. And um, this is basically, Newt is part of the system. So if you're out there voting or planning on voting for Newt, which not many people are because, you know, when I look around here in Austin, Texas, I don't see Newt Gingrich signs in people's yards. I don't see Newt Gingrich bumper stickers. I don't see Newt Gingrich t-shirts. He is a flash in the pan. He is a man of no substance. And um, he doesn't really have the political support out there. He may have the Fox News support, and he may have all this big media support because they want somebody like him in there because he is for the status quo. And uh, if you're interested in, in somebody who's not on the status quo, check out Ron Paul because he is a man that is talking the same ideas 20 years ago. 
he's predicted a lot of this stuff was going to happen, especially with, uh, with the economy and the housing crisis. And then you got Newt, who made uh, over a million dollars as a consultant for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, that was your tax money. So you, we all paid Newt collectively over a, a million dollars to tell Newton or, or to tell Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac who knows what. But you know they were going in the tubes. So who knows, you know what sort of uh, consultation he gave them. And now we get to some really spooky news here on genetically modified mosquitoes. Uh, you may remember we played a clip on the show of Bill Gates. Um, he released mosquitoes into the crowd and may, made a chuckle about it. Well, now the Activist Post is reporting that genetically modified mosquitoes to be released in the U.S. for the first time. And it turns out genetically modified mosquitoes could be released in the U.S. as early as 2012. Um, they're actually going to release them in Florida. Of course, the risks these mosquitoes pose both on the environment as well as the health of all living creatures are highly unknown, leaving everyone with many more questions than answers. We've already seen how terribly genetic modification can threaten the environment and human health, yet people are still moving forward toward a genetically modified world. And it goes on to describe the mosquitoes are genetically modified with a gene to kill them unless they're given an antibiotic known as tetracycline. So uh, one thing I do know is that bats eat a lot of mosquitoes. So who knows what this is going to do to the bat population after they start eating these transgenetic creatures, um, you know, mosquitoes that are out there. Who knows what's going to happen once they start breeding with the population. And most of all, who knows what's going to happen once they start biting you. Are you suddenly going to need tetracycline? I mean, we don't know. We don't know what these things are going to do. So it's definitely not wise to mess with nature, yet you can't tell the mad scientists that who want to uh, terraform the planet with chemtrails and put fluoride in your water so you stay dumb and uh, put a lot of vaccines in your body, which leads us to this next article from CBS Detroit. FDA clears HIV vaccine for human trials. Well, I can tell you this. I did a few drug studies um, back in college when I needed some money, but you will not find me lining up for this, for human trials for this HIV vaccine. University of Western Ontario researcher, Dr. Chil Young Kang said his treatment is the only one to use a whole genetically modified HIV virus that's been killed, of course, much like methods used for polio, rabies, and flu vaccines. Let me tell you this. <clears throat> if you look on any vaccine label, you get the insert that comes with it, not the little uh, one sheet that tells you it's perfectly safe. But if you actually read the label, this is what you need to do for any of these vaccines. Get the insert, get your medical dictionary and read what those side effects mean, because it's written in all kinds of weird doctor language that you probably won't understand. But the one sentence that sticks in my mind for every vaccine insert that I've ever read, they all say this. And I'm going to paraphrase, but it's probably the quote. Um, has not been tested for cancerous or mutagenic potential. That's in every vaccine insert that I read that they wanted to stick into my kids. Every single one of them has not been tested to see if it causes cancer. And they do that for a reason, because we're gonna find out five, 10 years down the road that it is these vaccines that are causing cancer. And that's why our, our, our vaccine rate is high and so is our cancer rate. They're right there, neck and neck. And then you look at countries like Singapore, who have a very low vaccine rate, and they have a very high or a very low cancer rate to go along with it. So uh, there you go. FDA clears the HIV vaccine for human trials, and soon they'll be pushing it down your throat that you need it. And not to mention HIV is a bioweapon. Look it up. <clears throat> And now let's go to some really disturbing news. If you weren't disturbed enough by what we just read, oh, in uh, Egypt, and I watched this video today and it's really disturbing. You have these cops in their global love cop armor, body armor with their giant sticks, uh, beating up females, kicking females in the face, beating them repeatedly after they're down on the ground, not posing anybody any harm. They probably weren't posing anybody any harm to begin with but protesting their fake government that was, uh, that was backed by um, Western powers with this Arab Spring. So we're going to go to a video right now. <clears throat> go ahead and roll it, and I'll just talk over it. And it shows them severely just beating women over and over again unconscious. Here they are. Here's some protesters trying to drag the women away. And then there the cops go, and they start wailing. Look at this. And I, I believe... Uh, uh, there was some mu music going to this that they're playing in the background, too. 
But this is severely disturbing. And this goes on and on and on. Here he is kicking this lady in the chest who's completely passed out. She's not a threat to anyone. But I, I noticed they carry very large sticks. You can see their large sticks that they carry. And, you know, I really think this just has to do with the fact that these Egyptian police have very small male genitalia. And so they have to have these giant sticks to make up for that fact and beat on women because they're probably very insecure because their genitalia is so small. And uh, here they are running in fear because now the populace is fighting back. And it's just, this is sick. And this is what goes on here too. I mean, we're not immune from this. We've seen peaceful protesters here sprayed with pepper spray. We've seen them beaten repeatedly. And uh, this is just a sign of the times. This is going to increase more and more where stuff like this is going to seem common. They're going to play it so much. You're going to see these clips on YouTube. And then it's not going to seem like it's a big deal after a while. And you're going to uh, expect it. And uh, it's, just, it's, it's outrageous. And you can go read about it on, I think this is uh, the dailymail.co.uk. The headline is Middle East. Uh, I can't even read the yeah. Day of shame in the Middle East. Female protesters beaten with metal poles as vicious soldiers drag girls through the streets. It's, it's completely disgusting and shocking. But it's a sign of the times. It's what's going to be coming here to this country. Just wait. If it hasn't already. Moving on to uh, some Russian Libyan news. Russians push to investigate Libyan civilian deaths. The U.S. calls it a cheap stunt. And we reported on this back right when the invasion was happening, uh, right when the rebellion was happening, that uh, black Libyans were going to be targeted by this al-Qaeda force that NATO, that NATO had backed and that special forces were assisting. And, and then you, we go to some shots of a town called Twi Tyerga, Twierga, and uh, you can see blacks just laying on the ground. They're dead. Um, there's more shots of them. These some businesses, black-owned businesses that were burnt out. Here's some blacks that are being taken to uh, detention camps, and here's more black civilian deaths. And these are people who weren't fighting the war, who weren't backing either side, but just happened to be caught in the crossfire. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a little boy there, and we, and we also showed some video that McBreen put together that I really didn't want to show again because, although we should see it, um, the little girl with her jaw blown off, and. Um, you know, wondering why she was, you know, dying a, a gruesome death. And it's, it's horrible. And there were civilian deaths, and there were a lot of civilian deaths in NATO and the United States. Don't want anybody to know about it. They want to pretend this was a honorable rebellion of people, and we all know it was al-Qaeda. And now you got one of the governors there in Libya who's now leading the attack into Syria. So I'm not questioning whether these regimes were good or bad or not, but... You know, putting in Al-Qaeda, our supposed enemy, is that good? Is that what we should be supporting? I don't think so. And now we're going to end with a, a bit of nice news. Back in 2004, there was a um, tsunami that went through the Indian Ocean, and this girl was swept away by it. And uh, she survived seven years living with other people and finally made it back to her home. And uh, she was swept away seven years ago. On Friday, she broke down in tears after tracking her parents down, who had long lost hope of finding her alive. She can only remember her grandfather's name saying it was uh, Ibrahim, and someone tracked the man down by that name, and they were unsure if it was actually his uh, granddaughter, and then they summoned her, and there was a great reunion, and, uh, you know, I guess that just shows the enduring human spirit that we have, and that humans have, and that normal people have. And uh, hopefully we can stand up to these globalists in the coming years because, you know, 2012 is right around the corner. It's literally a week away. And uh, we're going to go to break now. We're going to show you, uh, I guess we showed this yesterday, we premiered it yesterday, but Amy Allen, she, who's a musician who wrote the Ron Paul theme song back in 2008, she's going to show you how easy it is to get on your phone and make some calls uh, in, in support of Ron Paul. Call uh, Iowa, where the, where the caucus is going to be. And you can do this on all the states of the upcoming caucuses. So she shows you how easy it is. The website's there. It's real easy to do. So this, this holiday season, when you're hanging out at your house with your relatives and you're watching football, well, why don't you pull up your laptop or your iPhone and start making some phone calls for Ron Paul. And let's, let's, let's see a landslide 
in Iowa so that the pundits could come back and say, oh, pay no attention to the landslide. It doesn't mean anything. You have to vote for Newt Gingrich or Mitt Romney, who uh, was just endorsed by George Bush. So if you want to, if you vote for Mitt Romney, you're supporting George Bush and all these illegal wars that him and his son and the rest of his ilk have done against our species and the rest of the human population. So I'm going to leave you with that. We're going to go to break and we'll be back with one of the makers of a noble lie and one of the uh, veteran uh, retired police officers, Don Browning, who said the FBI threatened him just because he was asking questions. And we'll get into that and a whole lot more. It's InfoWars Nightly News. Please consider becoming a member of PrisonPlanet.tv or check us out at InfoWarsNews.com. Thank you. What's up, nation? I'm Amy Allen, and I'm here to show you that you can cook dinner while participating in the Phone From Home program for the Ron Paul 2012 campaign. This is what I'm going to do today. I'm going to make some potatoes. I'm going to make some burger sliders, all while calling Iowa citizens and asking them three questions. I'm being connected to Ryan Reinke, Pauline Hawthorne. Oh my god, I can't pronounce that name. Hello, is Steve Rammstein available, please? Hi, is Gerald Putnam available, please? I'm not going to totally, you know, be like infomercial, like, oh, it's not really hard sometimes. I have just three questions. Okay. People hang up on you or whatever. That's not very cool. My name is Amy Allen, and I'm a volunteer helping to conduct a Republican presidential primary poll. This is so easy. You could literally do laundry, make dinner. You could walk the dog, I guess, if, if you didn't have to be close to the internet. Go ahead and kick it up a notch and add some garlic. Oh, I wonder if this is good. Hi, is Aurora Adams available, please? All you have to do is go to phone.ronpaul2012.com. It's fulfilling and it's um, rewarding. Right, Doug? That's not my dog, by the way. If you believe in this information and want to support its viral spread, go to the InfoWars store at InfoWars.com. We've got the new G.I. Joe InfoWars t-shirts. We've got the incredible ProPure gravity-fed filters available at InfoWars.com in the store. We've got a new DVD, Sign Us Under Attack, the Don't Tread on Me flag. We've got all sorts of different bumper stickers to help spread the rebellion virally. It's all there, wristbands, citizen rule books in every order. Order online at InfoWars.com today. The water filters, the canteens, it's all there. InfoWars.com. Dr. Ron Paul, more than 4,000 babies delivered. A man of faith, committed to protecting life. Some people need to have a good word said about them. Ron is the sort of person that his, his life is his good word. You know, you just knew that Ron cared about you. Life begins at conception, in my opinion, and as a result, I love to go to a doctor who felt the same way. He not only um, protects unborn life, but he also um, walks through journeys with women, and he has for years. I love the fact that he hadn't changed in all these years. Ron's still the same guy, still saying the same things, and now all these years later, still standing his ground. Ron did not let Washington change him. It's not hard for someone who is a Christian and who truly believes to stay on the right path. And I think that's what kind of person Ron Paul is. America has to have someone like Ron Paul today. There is no question. Welcome back to InfoWars Nightly News. Um, so did you get your laptop? Are you calling? Are you going to make some calls for Ron Paul this Christmas season when you're uh, sitting around watching football? Hmm? Hmm? All right. Oh, uh, all right. Now we're about to go to our interview with Don Browning and Holland Van Den Neuenhoff. But first, I want to show you a clip. This is an excerpt of from the movie A Noble Lie, and it's Don Browning um, talking about the autopsy that was done on, or that wasn't done on Terrence Yakey, who is the uh, one of the officers who got the key to the city. He was a hero, and uh, and then all of a sudden he ends up dead outside his car on this federal property with a gunshot wound to his head that he probably didn't give himself. Well, there's probably a 99% chance he didn't give it to himself, yet it was ruled a suicide. They went on and said he was drunk and drugs in his system, and then it was later revealed that, oh no, we did the toxicology test, and no, he didn't have any drugs or alcohol in his system. 
So this is a case of uh, killing the messenger, somebody who saw something that uh, he shouldn't have seen, and the FBI made sure he didn't say anything about it. And uh, also, I want to give a quick shout out to, uh, to my two boys who are watching tonight. How y'all doing? And, uh, but now let's go to this clip, and then we're going to bring in Don Browning, retired OKC K-9 unit police officer, and Holland Van den one of the researchers and producers of A Noble Lie. Let's go to that clip. One of the things that surprised me was that there was no autopsy performed. The other thing that really bothered me was we were being told that Terry was high on drugs and drunk. And, uh, of course, the medical examiner's office did a, a report on Terry and his injuries, uh, which was really not an autopsy, but just a uh, an overview. And uh, it showed that his BAC was was zero, meaning no no blood alcohol content, there was no drugs in his system. It bothered me that they didn't treat Terry like a uh, police officer like he was. Uh, he was. He was a good guy. A deputy sheriff recorded this footage during one of the evacuations. Here the ATF is seeing pulling out several weapons and blocks of what appeared to be plastic explosive. Was this the source of the bomb scare or did this ordinance come from an illegal armory that witnesses report the ATF kept in the Murrah building. The ATF denies they kept any weapons or explosives in the building. And you just saw an excerpt from A Noble Lie uh, with an interview with Don Browning, retired OKC police officer. And then we went into what is being referred to as the Sumter tape, and that was uh, just a little snippet of some tape that was shot during the uh, rescue effort, and it shows in verifiable proof of uh, ATF agents removing guns and what appears to be plastic explosives from the rubble. And uh, so without further ado, we turn to our guests. We have Holland Van Nuenhoff, Van, I'm sorry, Holland Van Den Nuenhoff and Don Browning, OKC retired police officer. Fellas, how are you doing today? Great, excellent. And when you guys left off with Alex's uh, interview yesterday, uh, you were talk Alex was talking about how um, you know how how come not more of the police officers came out and, and you were saying you felt that they uh, you didn't have enough to circle the wagons and uh, why don't you elaborate on that a little more how many officers during the time did that you were in contact with um, felt that something was fishy something was going on I think maybe uh, any of that were really outspoken was less than a half a dozen uh, I had good friends that uh, uh, I really felt I could trust, uh, become really irritated with me, and uh, I refused to even speak about the bombing. Uh, so it was, it was kind of a, uh, a disappointing time frame as long as well as being a cautious time frame about who you did talk to and, and uh, who you would believe uh, with what information that you got. And. At any point, did uh, did you guys get together and formulate a plan if you were going to come forward, what you were going to say, or did it even make it into that stages? Uh, I never really made it into that stages. There was one or two uh, uh, that I really held as confidence that, uh, uh, especially when I was getting ready to go to the grand jury over Terry Yakey and, and some of the other uh, uh, issues. Uh, even by the I was warned that I really needed to be careful and uh, was this really something that I was willing to do uh, career-wise uh, more than anything else. And how long did you stay on the force after uh, OKC? I retired in 99, uh, so uh, four years, almost five years later. Uh, it, the wind had gone out of my sails and it was just, uh, just really did not enjoy the job anymore. Right. And and then uh, I guess I'm just trying to trace your path of when you started to talk about this more. When when did you start um, doing interviews and talking to people? I know uh, Alex Jones, I think, has interviewed you in the past, and uh, and then the OKC guys who are making a noble lie. Uh, pretty much started, I guess, within the first couple two or three weeks, beginning with JD Cash uh, on into Roger Charles and some of the other ones that were doing some. Uh, uh, investigative work to start with. Mm -hmm. And did you work uh, with Charles Key at all during his investigation? Yes, sir. Uh, did make meetings with them. However, at that time, I was told that uh, 
uh, I needed to cease my contacts that I was having, that I was running with the wrong group, that I apparently was part of the militia, uh, and that I was being uh, uh, monitored. Uh, right. uh, so I was, I, I did not want to uh, to bring any heat down on Charles or BZ or any of the guys that were hoppy, any of the ones that were really uh, uh, in the forefront of this. So I, I did uh, curtail as much as I could uh, meetings with them. Mm -hmm. And and so you, you you said that in Alex's interview about how uh, people were saying you were in a militia. Um, what? Was was the the mode going around at the time? Like, if you were had anything to do with any type of militia movement, you were deemed uh, a suspect. I guess is that uh, to a degree, um, uh, at least that you didn't hold the the same views as as what the government viewpoint was on on uh, especially the bombing uh, and and persons that were behind it. Mm -hmm. And Holland, when when did you guys start interviewing Don for the movie, and how how is that? Kind of progressed into you know his story fitting into some of the pieces uh, you know there's a lot of pieces to this story how how does Don fit into this for for you guys in the film? <clears throat> well, I mean this has been an inter interesting process because I started out just as a researcher and so I was reading all these names and, and studying up on the bombing. Then I meet State Representative Charles Key. I meet Don Browning. I've read about these men's work before, so that was very it's very interesting to, to to go through that. Uh, Don Browning, I mean, he he took part in the um, the rescue and recovery from day one, from hour one, and he was one of the first to raise questions. He was an Oklahoma City police officer. He's also a, a former Marine uh, veteran of Vietnam. I'm also a former Marine, so we formed kind of a connection there. But uh, it's uh, you know we're dealing with a very um, <clears throat> could could be called crazy information or something like that. But we're when you're talking about police officers, state representatives who are presenting evidence that there was something wrong with the bombing, that there was foreknowledge, that there were warnings, that there were other bombs in the building. This is my hometown. It is our duty to try to find out what happened. 168 people were killed in Oklahoma City that we know of. There was an extra leg found in the rubble that no one knows who that leg belongs to. And that, and that person, whoever that was, remains unacknowledged by the official count whatsoever. There are so many unanswered questions. There are so many people who died as a result of this. During the bombing and after, several witnesses have been killed. Terry Yakey, Dr. Plumley, a lot of other people. And we need to find out what happened because if, it, if we don't find out what happened and who ultimately is responsible, it's going to happen again and it's going to get worse. Yeah, I agree. And the next one, it's, it's not gonna be pretty. They're, they've got the infrastructure set up to really come down on anybody who's outspoken against the government for any reason. Yeah, I mean, they just passed the NDAA, uh, which where they can detain American citizens in the homeland, which is counted as a battlefield. Well, I, I'm on that list. Our website has been classified as a domestic extremist terrorism website, mm -hmm. all, but it doesn't do anything. It just, we just sell books through it. I mean, that's all it is. So under the new law that's being passed, I, Don, people who ask questions, his life has already been threatened for asking questions. Now it's going to become legal. To, to snatch you, literally snatch you up off the streets if you ask questions about the official story. And that's why the noble lie is so important, because this is used, they wave the bloody shirt of Oklahoma City to, to invoke all these police state powers. Mm -hmm. But they don't actually go after the perpetrators, they use it against the American people. Right, right. The, the investigation seemed to be the afterthought. Uh, what seemed to be more, more on the forefront was getting this new terrorist le legislation passed at the time. And Don, let's go back to OKC. What were you actually doing um, on that morning before the bomb even went off? I was uh, at my residence. Uh, Wednesday night was our uh, canine training evening, so what I, I I normally would work a day shift. So what I would do is sleep in late uh, on Wednesday morning and prepare to train all night Wednesday evening. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, was at my residence and uh, uh, felt the the house shake. Uh, interestingly, we had had an earthquake uh, a month prior to that, and so I thought it was just another earth tremor. And uh, uh, then almost immediately, the phone was ringing and, and uh, uh, warning canine units downtown. Right. And so from the time it happened to the time you arrived, how, how much time had elapsed during that point? Probably 35 to 40 minutes. Okay. Um, and then, you know, when uh, with the dog, you're not really doing much rescue. Are you, were you looking for bodies or bombs? What, what was the purpose of the dog? 
when we when we first arrived at the scene, uh, of course, I exited the vehicle with the dog, uh, and and that very intent was to uh, look for victims. Mm -hmm. uh, however, we were we were told to take the dogs away from the scene, uh, to put them back in the cars. That, that if we were going to help with any of the recovery, we were going to have to do it uh, alone. Um, so that's one again, way they impeded the rescue effort, right there. Yes, sir. Okay, continue. Go ahead. Um, we did put the dogs up, came back in. There was uh, two other canine officers, uh, Ron Burks and Randy Claypool, uh, uh, were there at the scene with me at that time. We went back. Uh, I think it was a fire chief uh, grabbed Randy and had him guard a, a door that would be close to where the uh, daycare center was on the south side uh, to not allow any admission into it. It was a pretty sure drop off mm -hmm. from that point. Uh, Burks and I did go back down into the bowels of the building and uh, uh, again worked in that area uh, around Dana Bradley uh, trying to secure uh, debris in that area to keep it from shifting while, while they were working on her recovery. Okay. And then when did the uh, bomb threats at that point start coming in where they found the second and third bomb that was reported on television? There was uh, one of those that had already occurred at that point. The second one uh, came shortly thereafter. Um, uh, but again, like I said, I had already talked to one of the bar bomb techs, and he uh, had told me that it was a toy bomb, that uh, uh, nothing really to be worried about. So I wasn't really uh, concerned about uh, evacuating the building. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, at that point, we really didn't feel like we had any choice uh, that to stay where we were at. Uh, what kinds of things were the government officials doing, or government servants, I should say? What were they doing um, during this rescue effort? What kind of presence were they having on the building? Uh, more monitoring than anything else. Uh, uh, U.S. Marshals were, uh, it was interesting, was really uh, scrutinizing who was in the building. Um, uh, and to one point, unless you were an Oklahoma City firefighter, they were not going to allow you to be inside. And, and we were actually ordered out of the building uh, uh, by a, a federal marshal. Uh, we're in uniform, were easily identified as Oklahoma City police officers uh, uh, that had no bearing. We went ahead and, and uh, disregarded him, uh, stayed until uh, we did have enough help down there to where we were. Uh, uh, to the point we felt we could leave the building, get ready to get the dogs. They were forming up search teams through the fire department, uh, and we were going to coordinate with them. Mm -hmm. uh, but about the same time, everybody was ordered out of the building, and, uh, and that's when we were more or less sequestered in the courtyard area. And uh, uh, eventually was told that they, uh, by a blonde female FBI agent, or at least had an FBI raid jacket on, uh, that until uh, files that were so critical to the government were located, there would be no more recovery uh, performed. And this is while people are bleeding inside the building. They actually stopped the evacuation to recover these documents. Yeah, I, I remember watching the uh, the news footage, the raw news footage that was uh, off VHS tape. That was in Alex's film, 9-11 Road to Tyranny. And that, probably more than even the 9-11 information, woke me up because I remember Oklahoma City vividly um, I was in, uh, oh, I was 15 at the time, and, um, and it really, uh, it, it kind of burned me up after seeing all this footage and then seeing, you know, it was one truck bomb, no one else was involved, it was one lone nut with an accomplice, and, and then you go back and actually look at the evidence, and the evidence is, uh, you know, you guys have gone over the evidence. Why don't, let's talk about a few things. Um, let's talk about the surveillance cameras. You guys talked about that on Alex's show. Um, Yes, sir. Um, I was real familiar with the Federal Bear of the Murrah Building because uh, I, prior to being in the canine unit, I was in the Motor Patrol. Uh, if we had din dignitary uh, coming into town, such as the president or vice president, we would meet with the Secret Service there in the Murrah Building uh, and go over that itinerary. Uh, but was in and around that building frequently uh, and saw the cameras that were mounted both on the north and south side, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, and particularly on the corners of the building. Uh, the morning of the bombing, uh, when we were sequestered uh, there in the courtyard, there were FBI agents or, or men in FBI raid jackets. 
uh, that brought a ladder around and they were removing not only the cameras and the housings but actually the wire uh, from the uh, corners of the building and taking the cameras down. So to make it appear like there were no cameras there or just to take the whole I, unit I, out? At, at the time, I thought they were, uh, I, I didn't, you know, of course, what were they thinking? I was assuming they were just securing evidence. I mm -hmm. never dreamed uh, that it would come up to the point that, no, they never existed. But um, So uh, it, and as an afterthought, it may, it may have even been like they were trying to conceal evidence. Yes, sir. Okay. In fact, uh, one of our witnesses, Mike Nations, <clears throat> who lived in the Regency Tower, he observed uh, a couple days or a week before the bombing, Tim McVeigh at a phone booth with another man, a John Doe number two. Uh, Mike uh, went to the FBI and told them about this. Their response was to go down and remove the phone booth from that corner. They actually took out the phone booth in response to Mike saying, I saw McVeigh there. I'm 100% sure it was him, and he had a partner. Wow. And so now, if the phone booth doesn't exist, the story doesn't have any corroboration. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Interesting. Uh, There's also uh, reports of the horse patrols being mobilized. Did, did you actually see this, Don, when you were on, on site? No, sir. Uh, I saw them at on site um, uh, in talking with uh, friends that was in them because we officed together between the K9 and the Quine uh, units. We officed in the same building. Um, I was curious how they had gotten there so soon because they, they form up with the uh, reserve deputy program and uh, respond as a mutual aid type thing to larger uh, events. Uh, and they were all down there that morning. Uh, later, uh, when I actually had a chance to talk, I was, I was curious as to why they came down and oh, we were just we were just coming down for the day just to uh, work the downtown area, uh, which is um, was not normal for them. Um, uh, they did not form up in, in, unless there was a special event, they did not have the, uh, especially the reserve deputies. Those guys had other jobs besides law enforcement and uh, they were donating their time. Uh, so it was, it was uh, kind of ironic that they were all down there together that morning uh, to do nothing but just ride around downtown Oklahoma City. Right. Did you ever provide uh, testimony to a grand jury or any investigators, or did, were you even called to, as a witness at any point? Yes, yes sir. Uh, did go to the grand jury twice, uh, and then testified against McVeigh and Nichols both in Denver. Mm -hmm. And what what exactly did you testify mm -hmm. against Nichols about? Uh, primarily, it was just the aftermath okay. of the uh, bombing itself. So, and same with McVeigh. Okay. So you, you never actually saw Timothy McVeigh at the Murrow building? No, sir. No, sir. Okay. Uh, well, let's get, into, uh, let's get into the FBI threats. You said they, they came up and threatened you personally on several occasions. Um, why, why don't you describe that for the, for the audience out there who's watching? Yes, sir. I, uh, at one point, uh, uh, probably four to six weeks after the, uh, the actual uh, recovery effort had ended, uh, they set up a mobile communication post, uh, the FBI did at our uh, K-9 Equine Center. Uh, they were using our, our facility pretty frequently, both between the offices and their, the trailer they had set up. Uh, it was not uncommon for uh, uh, one of the newer agents to, to come through the hallway, and uh, I would be pointed out by uh, one of the other uh, agents that, yeah, that's that's him there, that's, that's Browning. Uh, and then as, as they were there, uh, in passing in the hallway, I would be told uh, by one or two different agents that uh, I need to be careful that people like my wife and I uh, ended up dead. That's incredible. Holland, what's your response to that? Well, well, outrage, honestly. This is the FBI. These are federal investigators. They're supposed to be trying to solve the greatest mass murder at that time in American history. But what they do spend time doing is threatening local police officers, threatening their families' lives. Mm -hmm. And this tells you what their mission, their, their mission was not to solve the case. Their mission was to cover up what actually happened. It was not to bring those who were responsible to justice. And to do so, to, to preserve their own position, they're threatening good men's lives and their family. That tells you the nature of what is going on here. And, and let's just go over some of their, their evidence cover-up that you guys go over in the movie. Um, just, you know, let's, let's go over a laundry list. What did the FBI do to really thwart the investigation? 
Well, <clears throat> obviously the videotapes. Um, the videotapes recorded everything that happened. There were dozens, hundreds. In fact, we interview the man who duplicated the tapes on order from the FBI. He wasn't allowed to view the footage. They would wheel it in on dollies. Two armed agents would watch while he put the tapes in and duplicate them, and he was not allowed to watch them. Then those armed agents would wheel the tapes out at the end of the day and take them back to the office. This lasted two to three weeks of eight, nine-hour days of recording videotapes. Obviously, a lot or most of those tapes have nothing, but some of them have something, and some of them recorded what exactly happened in front of the Murrah building. Don is talking about the FBI taking down the tapes during the evacuations while people are bleeding to death inside. They're taking down the tapes, and now they claim the tapes don't exist or that they can't find them. They can't find the tapes or that the ones that can find cannot be released due to national security. What is so... What... What is the threat to national security to find out exactly what happened at the Murrah building, dis Murrah building despite the fact what, what it would cause is a case of national insecurity. If people knew from day one, from day one, that the federal government knew there were more people involved and lied about it, the people would be outraged. They cannot allow that to get out. Yeah, national security at this point should not be an excuse because... Well, they supposedly killed Tim McVeigh, Terry Nichols is in jail. Those were the only two guys involved, according to the official story. So what, what would be the harm? You know, that's, that's usually the icing on the cake. They always come out with the tape later after the case is done. Here's all the tapes. Here's what they show. And there was even an investigation at one point. I remember um, some, uh, watching an, an old news clip where they interviewed people who had saw tapes, and they were talking about John Doe number 2 that supposedly didn't exist after a two-day manhunt. Yes, the um, several FBI offices were leaking information to the media that they had seen the tapes, that there were other people involved. But as the story became managed, uh, that information was shut off, and we were never allowed to see the tapes. I mean, we have to see, we almost every day have to watch airliners crashing into the twin towers. Almost mm -hmm. every day have to see that. How come we can't see what happened in front of the murder building? Right. Well, the same reason why you can't see what happened in front of the Pentagon, except exactly. for two frames. Yeah. Um, Don, did you uh, participate in the manhunt for uh, John Doe number two? that ended up being called off? No, sir, other than um, uh, I think what was confusing to me at first was is when they first started putting out the descriptions, in particularly that first day, uh, descriptions that they gave us uh, and was broadcast to all law enforcement in a, in a five-state area, uh, they later told us it was disinformation and it was only to throw the press off. Um, <laughs> Uh, again, you're you're hampering all law enforcement in the, in that big a quadrant of the United States. Uh, going after a wild goose chase. Going after uh, an intentional wild goose chase. Sure. Well, that that information that led to that original uh, witness description was from local PD. Yeah. And then and those were the suspects. Um, and as the federal government came in and took control of the investigation, that uh, that description, what they, they labeled it disinformation so people would stop following it. Those actually were the suspects. They were seen running from the scene, getting into a brown pickup truck, speeding from the scene. Uh, one car was in route to Dallas, was actually, they, those people were arrested with bomb making material in Dallas. They were let go. I mean, it's just, the story does not hold up to scrutiny whatsoever. The official story of the Oklahoma City bombing is a complete whitewash and does not hold up to the weight of evidence whatsoever. Right. Well, Holland, the film's been out less than a month now. What, what kind of reaction are you guys getting from other people, um, filmmakers? Uh, you know, what are, what are the plans for this film, A Noble Lie? Well, um, the reaction we're getting is, is stunned at disbelief that all of this could happen right under our noses and the media and the government does not tell us about it. A lot of people who, who knew some funny things about the bombing, they, they knew a couple things were wrong. But they, they, they were not aware of the weight of evidence and how documented it was that the official story is wrong and is a lie. Um, they were stunned by the quality of information. Uh, we've shown this to skeptics. We've shown this to people who, you know, think I'm crazy, and they're and they and they walk away, and they're like, uh, "The government did it." I was like, "Yeah," um, and now we're not saying that the government did it. What we're saying is that they knew it was going down. That is obvious. They knew McVeigh was going to do it. They watched it happen. For some reason, they didn't stop it. And the cover-up after that, is not, it's not that every street agent, every FBI agent on the scene is like trying to cover up government complicity. It was their truck. It was their informant. It was their bomb. How are they going to explain to the American people that something went wrong and their truck, their bomb, and their informant killed 168 people? They were and, in the agency. Right. And, and, and since then, every, every FBI entrapped uh, bomb maker or bomb plotter, they've been given deliberately fake bombs we've seen or, or bombs that wouldn't work or, or, or they get stopped before it even 
comes to fruition there. I, I remember seeing an article about the guy with the remote control bomb, but he was getting it from the FBI and the informant. You know, they were providing him the materials to to create this remote controlled airplane bomb. And uh, you know, do you, did you see that story? Do you have any comments on that? Oh yes, yes. Uh, when, when, you, when you're looking at the the last couple of years, all these FBI sting operations on terrorist operations, what usually happens is it's it's like a, an unemployed drifter. He gets on a, a jihadi website and he starts talking trash about the U.S. government, mm -hmm. and then someone approaches him and they start cultivating a relationship. Well, that person obviously is an FBI undercover informant or an agent trying to cultivate this uh, disgruntled loner. And then they give him a job, they, they, they uh, brainwash him into wanting to bomb something in the United States, they tell him to do it, they give him fake bombs, they, then, they, then they give him the cell phone to set it off, then they arrest him. I mean, and that's obviously is entrapment. If the FBI had left these people alone, they'd still be working at McDonald's, that's all sure. they'd be doing. They, they wouldn't be trying to bomb things. But the danger of that is, if they ever try to make this go live again, all they have to do is take one of these existing sting operations. They're going on right now all over the country. It's like every two weeks mm -hmm. they, they, they arrest someone for trying to bomb something. These operations are going off all the time. For an operation to go live, all they have to do next time, instead of fake explosives, put in real ones. And then let it happen. And let it happen. Yeah. And then be right there all of a sudden with a description and a, and a suspect that they've apprehended. And it's all nice and neat and mm -hmm. fits into their... Their little uh, dandy tail. I was having a, a, a discussion uh, two nights ago with a relative who came in to visit, and um, you know, I said, what, "What are your thoughts on OKC?" And he goes, "Well, you know, Timothy McVeigh, we got him." I said, "Well," and I started going into the evidence and the blast wave and and the debris ending up on uh, on the other side of the blast wave, which is a physical impossibility, and and then the other evidence with the tapes and Terrence Yakey being uh, being killed. And we'll go into that in a second. And he said, well, why, why do you think they would do this? And, you know, my answer, and at, at a gut level, I feel it's, it's some sick form of job security. The more terror they can create and, and keep out there, you know, the more money they get for body scanners and militarized weapons and, you know, all this stuff to, to supposedly make us feel safe, which doesn't really make us feel safe, but it enriches these people who create this type of stuff. Yeah, well, you have the underwear bomber, and then the next week after that, uh, they're running, they're uh, rolling out the naked body scanners, which had already been ordered. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it is. I mean, it, in 1995, there was a whole lot of job insecurity going on in the federal government. People were upset with the two-party system. We see with the popularity of the Ross Perot campaign, mm -hmm. um, uh, Oliver Stone's JFK had just been released. People were finally beginning to understand the nature of their government, and people were upset. Waco, Ruby Ridge, the ATF and the FBI were facing heavy heat. Mm -hmm. People were talking about. Resolving the ATF, that could not be allowed to happen. No. Um, could not be allowed to happen. And you're right. I mean, I'm, I'm going to steal that phrase. It probably is a, a sick form of job security. Yeah, it, it, it really. Uh, Don, since you've retired, you've seen, you know, the police become militarized. What, how do you feel about that? I, I regret it. I, I always uh, relished in the thought that they referred to us as peace officers mm -hmm. uh, when I first hired on and, and to the point now that uh, uh, you know the common phrase is police officers but they have become very militaristic uh, and almost standoffish from the public themselves uh, uh, I regret it I don't I don't understand why there has been the change that there is um, uh, the rank and file officer probably is not enjoying his career nearly like what uh, myself and my, and my generation of police officers did. Mm -hmm. and, and Don is not, just, you know, Don carried a machine gun in the jungles of Vietnam. Right. So he knows what the difference between war and peace. He's done both. And, and as a peace officer, he wants to secure the peace. He doesn't want to he doesn't want to fight the American people, and that's what a lot of the police are doing these days. They have tanks, they have drones, um, and they're viewing the American people as the enemy. Uh, well, actually, the, the homeland is now the battlefield. Yeah, yeah. They've just moved the battlefield from Iraq and Afghanistan over to the United States where they can have uh, 330 million plus more uh, victims to go after. Uh, before before we end this, uh, let's get uh, into Terry Yakey. I mean... That it, how, were, how good of friends were you with him? Was were you guys talking about this stuff during the investigation? We, yes, sir. We were talking about it. We were we were not uh, socially uh, extremely close friends. Uh, uh, workmates, yeah, and supportive of one another very much. So uh, uh, 
to the point that I would tease Terry and he would tease back, uh, especially after his picture came out on Newsweek, that he was my hero mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, appreciated what he had done. And uh, 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 But again, Terry had a little bit of a closed side, such as I did, that, that there were some things that, that uh, uh, you just were very cautious about talking to other police officers about. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, because you don't know who's on which side at that point. Exactly. Right. I've had two. I've had two police officers actually come up to me out of the blue uh, because I was actually um, passing out some flyers on the Oklahoma City bombing at an event. They were working security there, and they're from a jur different jurisdiction. And they walked up to me. They saw what I was doing. They said, "Hey, you remember that Oklahoma City cop?" I was like, "No." I was like, "Who?" And they said, "The one that was found in that field." I was like, "Yeah." And uh, the police officers, said, "Yeah, I think they killed him." And I was like, "Well, yeah, I know." I mean, the message was sent to law enforcement and the first responders: keep your mouth shut or we will kill you. That was the literal lesson. Right. And what, what was the reaction around uh, the office when that happened, when they found Terry Aiki and they said, oh, it's a suicide? <clears throat> there was a lot of disbelief. Uh, we were told even by our chaplain uh, that Terry was, uh, was drunk and was high on drugs uh, at the time of his death. Uh, that didn't yeah. fit Terry. And uh, uh, when the ME report finally was released, it showed no blood alcohol uh, mm -hmm. content, no drugs in the system. Uh, but by that time, they'd already had the story out that he was drunk and high, and that had been right. playing around for weeks. And Yes, sir, and yeah. that it was related to marital trouble. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they slandered his character. The, the, the superiors within the police department slandered his character after he died. Before he died, he was a hero. He was a hero. He was three days away from receiving the Medal of Valor, the highest award the department can offer. And then after he dies, suddenly Terry's a scumbag. Right. Makes you wonder. Jeez. Uh, you know, and who knows what kind of evidence he had if he would have been able to bring it forward and what they, what they got from him. <clears throat> well, uh, when he was when his car was found in El Reno, uh, the the patrolman reported that there were several boxes of documents in the back seat. When that car was processed for evidence, there was no mention of anything in that car, in the document uh, wise. How convenient! Jeez. Well, Don, I want to give you the last word on this. Um, I want you to look out and talk to people, especially police officers, who may know of this stuff or may have been in on a cover up or something. I mean, what do you have to tell them? You know, in order. You know, in order for us to get this country back, we have to start telling the truth and, and coming up with this. I want to give you the last word to tell, you know, what, what are your, your final feelings on, you know, coming forward and, and what other people should do if they feel like they know something and that, you know, they should bring it forward. What do you want to say? I would say to them that, that our integrity and loyalty are the only two things that we have to sell to the American public. And uh, if we cannot maintain those, then uh, we should not be police officers. Uh, uh, that, that's not the, the uh, involvement work field that we should be in. And uh, uh, if we can't be true to this, the public, at least we should try to be true to ourselves. And uh, I regret it. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, guys, I thank you for joining us. Uh, it was about a 30 minute interview we just did, and that, that's great. I, I, I really think this information, it, it's time for it, it to come out again, and I think people are ready for it now because they've seen the utter corruption that's going on in their face, the, the stealing, um, you know, the police brutality that's going on, and people are ready to be woken up. And this is just another uh, pill, you know, to help do that. So I want to thank you for coming on the show, and we're definitely going to have you guys on in, in the future and, and promote this film. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, and that was Holland Vanden Neuenhoff and uh, Don Browning, retired OKC police officer. And, of course, you can get A Noble Lie here at the InfoWars store. It's available, uh, 1995. Um, I think they're in their second pressing now, so it's, it's getting, getting a flood of popularity out there. And this is something you really need to show, as Alex has said, to police officers, to military people, people who don't believe in the official story. Sit down and say, well, look, you don't believe in the official story let's sit down for two hours watch this film and then talk about it that's all you need two hours and if you still don't believe it after watching this film fine i won't bother you anymore but i think you're going to find people who have common sense and who have dignity and who have honesty and they've just had the wool pulled over their eyes you know they're going to come to that realization and we're going to have more people out there who know the truth and who are ready to take it uh, you know, to the next level because we're going to have to keep talking about these kinds of things until we stop the corruption and uh you know, and, and take our country back and for, what, for what the founders meant it to be, a place of uh, liberty and freedom where people can come and do what they want 
and uh, and make the money that they want and do the things that they want, fulfill their dreams. And uh, you know, that's pretty much all I have to say. Please consider becoming a subscriber. Here at PrisonPlanet.tv, you can watch InfoWars Nightly News. We're producing it five nights a week. And uh, if you want to send me an email with your suggestions, robd at InfoWars.com. Uh, I love hearing your suggestions. After I, uh, This is my second time hosting now, and after, after the first, I got a lot of great emails, a lot of encouragement, a lot of guest suggestions, and I do appreciate it. We're looking at everything that you guys send in. And, um, you know, please consider becoming a member. If you're not, if you're watching this on YouTube, spread it around. Let people know because this is information that really needs to come out. And I sincerely believe that or I wouldn't be here spending, you know, five days a week, 10, 11 hours a day doing it. And I want to thank the crew out there. And we'll be back uh, next week. Um, Alex is going to have a special on Monday with Ron Paul, some vintage Ron Paul clips that you've probably never seen. And let me tell you, the guy doesn't change. He is the same person back in 1988 that he is today. It's the same guy running for president. And it's time that we get somebody with a little bit of honor and with a lot less baggage in there so he can't be controlled by those with the purse strings. And uh, for that, I'm Rob Dew, and this is InfoWars Nightly News. We'll see you around.